All right, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour this morning. Uh, so good to see you here. Uh, this is a, a fun equipping hour for us. We get to interview Bob and Kathy Taylor. Uh, we're a little bit overdue on uh, all of us together getting to know them, but they've been to most of the small groups in the church, and so you've been able to interact with them and uh, interview them uh, already in home. So we get to do that together this morning in equipping hour. Uh, I'm going to open our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Again, another Sunday, another reminder, first day of the week, that you cracked open the tomb, conquered death, defeated the grave, that your death in our place was acceptable before your Father as a sacrifice of atonement, uh, that we could go free, that we could live. And uh, to gather together with your people again on a Sunday morning is just another reminder of what you've done for us. It is a joy uh, this morning for us to uh, interact with Bob and Kathy. We're so thankful that you brought them to Grace Bible Church. We do ask that this church would be able to serve them well, even as they have served us so well in such a short time. Uh, we're thankful for their friendship, uh, their love for you, their love for the church. Uh, we ask that our time this morning would honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Bob and Kathy Taylor, uh, the three of us have something in common. Uh, none of us are particularly comfortable sitting up here. Yeah. Uh, what I had hoped to do was to invite all of us to sit up here together to simulate sort of a living room, uh, to sort of uh, take some of the discomfort off. But, but essentially, that's what this is this morning. Uh, we're sitting together. Uh, I, I get to ask some questions of Bob and Kathy Taylor just to let their hearts uh, be out for all of us. And I hope really this is just priming the pump uh, for lots of interaction uh, that you get to have with Bob and Kathy uh, in the, the days and the years to come. So um, I want to just start with baseball. Yeah, you guys are baseball fans. Yeah, good place. And uh, who's your team? Kansas City Royals. Are they still a team currently? They're in the playoffs. They're in the yeah. playoffs. Okay. Uh, that's sad for all of us. Here, um, I want to know how you feel about the Diamondbacks not being in the playoffs. <laughs> Maybe this wasn't the right place to start. Uh, you know, I, I, in my mind, I think I could probably have a, an American League team and a National League team. How about in your heart? It's all American, you know. <laughs> the Royals. Okay, fair I enough. mean, look at, look at this. You've got your Kansas City Royals socks on this morning. And, I have Royal shoe. And you've got Royal shoe, one the, Royal shoe on. Even though they lost to Melissa's Yankees yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately. Right. Um, so, Kathy, why do you have one shoe on? What, what happened there? I wish I had a really good story, but I took a, our dog on a walk was walking in the backyard and tripped over a rock and broke my, I think it's the fibula bone. Yeah, that's what I broke, so. And how's it doing now? It's doing a lot better. Um, I'm hoping, I go to the doctor on Tuesday, so I'm hoping to get rid of the boot on Tuesday. So the, the sadness with a broken bone in the foot and the answer you just heard about baseball had an interesting intersection a few weeks ago uh, we had sort of a, a triple date, and uh, three couples went together to a D-backs game, and right after Kathy had broken her foot, she hiked up and down all the stairs at Chase Field. And you guys looked sad. No, did they? No, we won. You looked happy that the Diamondbacks won. Okay, good. We'll take that for whatever that's worth. You, you uh, we enjoyed side. it. We enjoyed the game, yeah. Okay, that's great. Now, Anything for baby. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk football. Uh, who's your team? Just say red. It'll be fine. Yeah, red. Red. Okay. Yeah. We'll go with red. The red team is their favorite. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. What has been your biggest surprise since moving to Arizona? My, mine has been mountains. Like, I... I don't know 
before we started talking, I'm not sure I could even tell you where Arizona was. Uh, I, I had been there, flown in years and years ago one time, but I, I was surprised when we flew in that there was mountains around it. And so that's, that was a big surprise. Mine has been um, two things. One is the record heat that we moved into for the whole summer and continue. You didn't have to do that for us, but <laughs> I'm glad to be part of history. And the other, th <laughs> the other thing is just the amount of color that is in the desert. I did not expect that. Even in our backyard, we have bushes that bloom hot pink and hot orange and hot yellow and it's just been the vivid colors. You said hot three times. I know. Everything. And I'm hot now. So <laughs> everything is hot. <laughs> well, you picked the wrong time in one sense to move here, but you also picked the right time. Uh, I do believe we're about to make the turn. We've yeah, been we've hearing that. that. We've been hearing that <laughs> since we've been here. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Yeah. Uh -huh. So... How did you two meet each other? You want to answer that? Well, I transferred in at semester to um, Southeastern Bible College, and um, this I we went on a double date with other people. That's how we met. I was with somebody else. He was with somebody else. So that's how we initially <laughs> met. And when you were on this double date, did you know that you were there for other reasons than you initially planned? No. No. You didn't no. realize no. it? No. Okay, so that came no. later. And because I had transferred in and it was a very conservative Bible college, I could not go on a date by myself because I was an incoming transfer student. So that's why we had to double date, and that's why Bob and his friend were with us. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way it was. <laughs> and Bob, at what point did you know that you were going to pursue Kathy? Well, it was soon after that, but she didn't notice me for, for years, you know, so what was it? We started really dating in, yeah, third year, so, yeah. But it worked she, out She wouldn't end. have anything to do with me before that, you know. Okay. But now she does. Now she does, yes. For, 40, for 43 years, she has. 43 years. Mm -hmm. And when's your anniversary date? August 1st. I didn't tell you I was going to ask that question, and you answered it right away, yeah, so good yeah, job. Yeah. Tell us about your family. Well, um, we have, I, I'm going to get this right. I wrote it down so I wouldn't get it wrong or call them by the wrong names. Um, so I, we have three children, and um, our oldest child is Heather, a picture Heather and Richard and they uh, Richard Heather married a, an orthodontist he was a dental student at the time and and then they have um, four four children one in heaven and they uh, live in Lincoln and they live in Lincoln Nebraska I got that one right so you can you can move on to the next one so the next one our uh, next is Tim and he's our oldest son, middle child, and he is an associate pastor in Lexington, Kentucky. They have four children, and his wife is Chrissy, and then they have Zoe, Ella, Rhett, and Silas. Our youngest is, um, is Jake, and he married Miranda. So they live in Edmond, Oklahoma, which is basically Oklahoma City, right outside of Oklahoma City. They have four children, three children, yeah. Were we breaking news? Is that a... <laughs> no, no. No, they have three children. And a dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, my mom is a redhead, yeah. And, and, his, and Tim's wife <laughs> has red hair in her as well. And then Jake is a... I think this is right, a commercial real estate banker in Oklahoma City. I'm not sure. We're not sure what he really does, but that's what he tells us. <laughs> yeah. Big properties. All right. We'd love to hear how God's grace in the gospel invaded your lives. So you can tell us how you got saved and, and or how God's grace has sustained you since then. Kind of any, any way you want to give testimony to God's grace in your life. 
Um, I grew up in a very solid Bible church and uh, family. My dad was a pastor. He's been a pastor my whole life. In fact, last Sunday was his last Sunday to be um, like the senior pastor, and he's been doing that for 65 years. So he's done that. And um, anyway, I never, I always knew about God. I always knew about Jesus. I always knew about the cross. And even as a small child, um, I remember hearing a vivid sermon on hell and knew that I didn't want to go to hell and knew that I probably would. So I ran home. It's in the days, in the old days when you didn't lock your house and your the church parsonage was right down the street. So I ran home and just cried and um, in my own way asked Jesus to come into my heart, but nothing changed. So my whole life, I was not the one that was going to cause trouble or stir anything up. So I followed the rules. I went to Christian high school. I did whatever everybody else did. I was a moral uh, girl, went to Christian college. And it was when I transferred to Southeastern Bible College that um, I saw people living differently and loving Jesus and living for Jesus. And that's when I um, knew that I was missing something. I didn't have that personal relationship with Jesus. So I... um, at that point is when I um, repented of my sin and knew I was a sinner and that the only way I was going to get to heaven was to be a believer and not to believe in Jesus and believe that he died for my sin and not just to ha- be get to heaven by my own works or righteousness. And that's how um, that all came to be. And then when after Bob and I got married, um, we got married at 20. We turned 21 the next year. We were pretty young. And after we got married, we moved from Alabama to Tennessee. Our church there had wanted to start a Navigators 2-7 group, which is a discipleship ministry that Navigators had. And so they asked us to be one of the couples in it. And we had two children at that point. And so we would meet Sunday night after church. And that was probably the first time in my life that I had um, somebody had discipled and showed me the disciplines of the Christian life, like reading your Bible, um, how to pray, how to meditate on scripture, how to memorize scripture. And we were accountable every week for what we had done that week. So because you had to share every week, you pretty much were on your game to get it done. So I think both Bob and I grew a lot in that those couple of years that we were there and did that and that established, um, I, it just established our walk with the Lord going forward and just the many different trials and things that the Lord put in our lives. And that's how, that's how we did that. And I think those were probably the most influential times in my life. And then just uh, along the way, different Different Bible teachers and preachers that we've had have been encouraging to us and strengthened our walk with the Lord along the way. I don't know if I have anything. (laughs) That's great. Bob, we'd love to hear from you. So I grew up in a uh, kind of a what would be identified as a typical Christian family type home. Um, I, I sang in the children's choir. I I, um, I was kind of a leader in, my, in our youth group at the church. My dad led the church choir. My mom sang in the church choir. Um, went to Sunday school and church every week. When the, the doors were open, they, they went. And um, I, was, I was taught in Sunday school the things you would th- think should be taught, that God was the creator of heavens and the earth, that that he was holy, that um, we even sang holy, holy, holy in the church. The Bible is true. I should obey it. Um, Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. I, I knew all of those things. I'd been taught all of those things. When I was about 12 or 13, I went to a summer Bible camp. This was where um, most of my, well, my elementary, later elementary through high school in college, uh, we lived in a little, um, little kind of. Uh, it would be what you would think of a fishing community in Western New York State, around a two and a half mile 
lake, had about a thousand people in the in the town, and um, that's where that's where this church was um, that I'm speaking about. Uh, and they had a little little Bible camp on the lake. And so I went to Bible camp when I was about 12 or 13, and the speaker there was what's considered like a fire and brimstone type speaker. And, but he said some things that, that I had heard before, but only this time it was different. He said this, this time, I don't know, it just caught my attention. Um, this time I really heard it. I heard the speaker say that the Bible says in Romans 3 that there's none righteous, there's none, not even anyone, that all have fallen short of the glory of God and they've sinned. The speaker said that the Bible says there's a penalty for that sin and that penalty was eternal death and separation from God. And I remember he read Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus and I wanted the gift uh, of God. I wanted eternal life. I didn't want um, eternal death. I wanted to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to hell. I thought it was a pretty good little boy, um, uh, much better than my brothers. And uh, I hadn't done anything really bad. I've, I, you know, I didn't steal anything. I didn't tell many lies. Um, and I, I probably only cheated in school a couple times. So I thought it was pretty good. For the first time, though, I realized that I was a sinner and I fell short of God's glory and that the Bible says that there's none righteous, not even good little Bobby Taylor. And the theme song for camp was a song, it was just a little 70s ditty called uh, Jesus Sets Me Absolutely Free. And uh, it goes something like this. Jesus sets me absolutely free. He died on Calvary. He gives me victory. Jesus sets me absolutely free. Praise his name. And that's enough to make me sing. That's enough to make me sing. My sins are all forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. That's enough to make me sing. And that song was kind of carried with me. It's carried with me all these years. And uh, that was 52 years ago. That day, God removed the blinders from my eyes. And I responded to God's word. That day, I bowed on my knees and I repented of my sins. That day, I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God led me to Southeastern Bible College, as Kathy said, and he, where I met her. And I'm just thankful for what he's done in my life. Give me a wife who is a believer. Give me three children who are believers with spouses that are believers. Um, just the kindness of God to allow that. And we, we're praying now for our grandchildren. Thanks, Bob. So 52 years ago, uh, new life, and, and now you're at Grace Bible Church. How did you get here? <laughs> it, it, where do I start? Do you want me to start at the beginning? <laughs> Wherever you'd like to start. Yeah. But wait, tell, tell us what you've done in ministry, where you've been, okay. uh, and how you ended up here. Well, I was a music major at um, Southeastern Bible College. That's where I graduated with a bachelor's degree in church music. Not the kind of music that Chris does here. This is church, old school church music, choirs and, you know, leading with my hands and, you know, all of that. Uh, so a little bit different. Um, but um, I, when I graduated from Bible College, I, my idea was that I was going to be uh, a minister of music at a church somewhere, full time, and it, and during that time, this was the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the church was kind of going through transitions, and um, they they started mixing those, like a music and youth guy, or uh, you know, 
it just it just didn't line up with with what I had been taught to do. So I never uh, really got there full time, but I was I served as um, I served as part time in churches in uh, in Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and um, Kansas. And all along those part-time jobs, the Lord gave me different secular jobs that um, where I just learned how to be a manager or learned how to ad be an administrator in different different many different kinds of roles. Um, and so uh, it, it was in, and so that was in Hutchinson, Kansas. We were nine years at Grace Bible Church in Hutchinson, Kansas. And um, uh, Kathy's dad was serving at a church in Kansas City called Mission Road Bible Church. He was the pastor there. And um, they had, they had, uh, they had a guy doing their music who was in um, chiropractic school, and he had graduated, and and so he was moving on, and it was Christmas time. They didn't have anybody to lead their music, so they asked me to come up from Hutchinson to do that for the month of December. And in one of those weeks, they said, listen, we'd like for you to come on full time. They were going through a building project as well. And um, in the building project, they uh, they were, it, it was, I don't know, it was a project that was hundreds of thousand dollars that ended up being $3 million because they didn't, uh, the asbestos, what they found it. it was a 1950s building, church building. The white suits came in, and that cost a lot of money. They opened up one place. All they wanted was to upgrade the bathrooms in the, from 1950s bathrooms and um, put an elevator in. And it, they opened up an area, an entryway, and we had a, they had a 100-year rain, flooded the entire basement, they also decided that they were going to be their own general contractor. So, so the church had to do everything that the just the the contractors didn't do: clean up anything that um, wasn't planned, like a basement flooding, a foot and a half of water in the basement, wicked up all of the sheetrock walls. The church had to go in and um, and uh, remove everything. Had a boiler system, everything had to come out, and so uh, they were in a they were in a tough place. As a, their own general contractor, they couldn't get contractors to work for them, and so and the ones they did get were really not good, um, and that in some cases did more hurt than help. So they just wanted somebody to come in and do some administrative things to try to help this process move and uh, coordinate the church together to try to um, just just get get it going um, and so so they asked me to come full time and do those things and and I did and so we served at Mission Road Bible Church doing that about five years later Kathy's dad decided to take a uh, uh, a small church that he grew up in, in the community he grew up in, in, in central Nebraska, in a very rural era, area of central Nebraska. And they, they needed somebody desperately. They, uh, they were down to about 30 people at this little church, and, and it was just dying. And so they asked him, and the third time they asked, he finally said yes, and they, he, he moved... And um, I was there, and I had no training in anything but music. And so, um, uh, so kind of had to hold the church together for, along with the elders, with, for, uh, for about seven months during that transition. 
we, uh, I called Kathy's brother, who had, who had graduated with Rick Holland from seminary. And, and he, was, he was the pastor in, in Hutchinson, Kansas, where we were. And so he said, you know, uh, I'll give you some names, because all I thought is if we could keep the pulpit ministry strong, we wouldn't lose people. And, um, and so we went to Grace Community Church, California, and he gave me a bunch of names, and I started contacting people. And every Sunday we'd bring them in. We weren't paying a salary to a, a pastor, so we were, well, I'd bring them in on Sunday. They'd, they'd preach. We'd send them out, and the elders would then take try to keep everything else together and do any discipleship or, or um, the evening services, those kind of things. Um, but in the process, Rick said, you know, I don't know, maybe even Holland might be interested. And I'm thinking, ooh, Rick Holland might be interested. And I only knew Rick Holland from Shepherd's Conference, and he was always the favorite speaker at Shepherd's Conference, other than MacArthur. And so I contacted Rick. And sure enough, he expressed some interest. Uh, nobody knew that he was looking around, and he was. And so um, the, the head elder and I went out to California the week, like three days before Christmas, and um, flew out there. And um, we, we talked with Rick for three or four hours at Starbucks in, in Santa Clarita. And, so, and that... You know, and then the next morning we did the same thing. We flew back, and Mike, the the head elder, would just kept saying, we kept just saying, he didn't say no, so that's a good sign, you know. And uh, we knew he was looking at some other places. We got word of that, um, and competing with some pretty big names, uh, and Mark Dever and um, and MacArthur were both. There, there was a church revitalization in D.C., and we were just thinking, okay, this we don't have a shot at this, and we just kept praying about it as elders, and uh, we kept moving forward because he never said no, and so intera every interaction we had with him on the phone never said no. Okay, we just, that's a good sign. That's, that's a, we just treated that as positive. Well, it got to the end, and he said that uh, he, he was kind of, we could kind of tell that it didn't seem to be uh, favorable. So uh, Mike said, listen, Rick, you need to come out here and just see what you're going to say no to before you say no. And so he s said that he did that because we flew out there to see him. And so he, could, he gave us that much. And um, we... We um, brought him in. I put together a kind of a cross-section of our church. We couldn't say to our church. All we could say is, listen, we're looking at somebody at Grace Community Church. Pray. And so every week we'd huddle around after the evening service and we'd get in little groups and we'd just pray for this person that they didn't know. And they just, it was the sweetest time. And, um, and so I put it together a cross-section of ministries and uh, older to younger people, about 40 people, and we met at Mike's house. Middle of the week, we flew Rick in and Kim, and we met with these people so he could see the church, cross-section of who we were, and and just, um, and we could take him around and show him Kansas City and that kind of thing. And what we found out, as soon as he came, Kathy and I took him to breakfast and he told us that they were looking at a church in Jacksonville, Florida. We didn't even know about Jacksonville, Florida. And we didn't know who this Scott Christmas was. And so, you know, Kathy's under the table texting her brother, who's Scott Christmas? What, what, what is that about? And Scott Christmas was moving out here. And uh, that left that church open. It was a TES church. And uh, there was interest there. And they were interested in him. And he was... They, Kim and Rick were actually on the way to Kansas City plotting their route to Jacksonville when they moved. And later on, Rick would say that um, on their way back from Kansas City, back to Santa Clarita, they, they realized that, that Kansas City was the place they were going to come. 
They did, and um, I served with Rick for 10 years um, in Kansas City as the executive pastor there. And so here, how do we get here? There's the rest of the story. Okay, uh, so from, from 16 years at, in, uh, total in Kansas City, um, the last three years we were in, um, in Nebraska. Kathy's dad moved to this little town in Nebraska, and um, he's now in the stages of thinking about entertaining the thought of re retiring. And he's wondering if I would come and help this little church the same way I was able to help Mission Road in bringing, with my connections around with pastors and trying to figure out how we might be able to get another pastor in there. And so um, that was a really hard, tough decision for me. And um, I really enjoyed my time at Mission Road and with Rick Holland. We were really, really close. And, uh, but we felt like that's what God wanted us to do. We went to there, we went there, um, and, and, uh, this past January, Rod was going to announce to the church, Rod, her dad, that he was going to step down, um, in, at the end of this year. And that way he would have been 84, 84 at that point. And in January, the week he was going to do this, do we have still have time? Am I going too long? Okay. Uh, uh, he had decided that, he had prayed a lot about this and decided that he just couldn't do it. He had spent 65 years in the ministry. He just, he just, uh, and so he took me out and he said, Bob, I, I just couldn't do it. And, and I, I really, I wanted to, I want to die in the pulpit. I mean, that would, that's his words. And um, so we realized, and I, and I said to him, you know, Rod, this is, this is the reason we're here. And, um, and so that if that's really what's going to happen, then you need a guy to come in here full time that could, um, that could preach, that, 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 that was trained to do that, a seminary guy that could could handle uh, what needs to be done and so that if you get sick or, you know, and we can tell the church that this guy is coming in to eventually replace you when that time comes, when you die in the pulpit, basically. Um, and he, uh, he, he agreed with that, and, and the church couldn't afford to have, it's a little small church, couldn't, 160 people, and they couldn't afford to, to have more than that. So we, so um, Kathy and I started praying about what God would have for us next and how we could help the church with that transition or bringing a guy in so that eventually they could serve together for a while and then whenever Rod decided. That was in January. February, we went to Courageous Churchman Conference Myself and a couple other guys, um, one elder in training and um, another guy who was an elder. And we, uh, we went to the conference, a great conference. We're headed home. We, we were in uh, the airport, and we we're flying in on a, in a, with the air, United, what was it, American Airlines? I never fly American Airlines ever, and so, but we for some reason they had cheap tickets, and we went, and uh, it was just better for one of the guys, and so we did. And I'm waiting to get on the plane to come back to Nebraska, and somebody comes up behind me and kind of hits my shoulders and says, "Bob Taylor, how you doing?" And that was you, <laughs> and uh, and so you know. I, I didn't think much of it. We were talking about ministry, what's going on. I kind of told you some conversations that I had while at, at the um, Courageous Churchman. And, uh, and you said, you know, let's grab lunch at my favorite restaurant in the Dallas airport. And so what was that, Pop, 
Papacitos. Papacitos, yeah. And so I said, sure, these guys wanted to go to Whataburger, the guys that I was with. So uh, they were happy to go there. We went there. You had the, the people you were traveling with got earlier flights, and then you have Dave, Dave Corrente and, with you, and he was going to join us. And at the last minute, he got an early flight, and we're the two of us are sitting in the, at the table. So it was just down to you and me and some fajitas. Yes, yes. And and all along, you're going through and you're saying, you see that chair right there in that, in that gate? This happened. I was sitting right there, and this thing happened. And then we go to the next one. You see that gate right there, that chair? I was sitting right there, and this happened. And, we're, and now we're having lunch. And you, uh, I was telling you, the story I just gave about Rod and the fact that we're we're just praying about what we should do and but I'm just kind of a, a anomaly in some ways I'm not a high powered executive pastor type guy I'm just I'm just Bob and uh, and so you said well tell me what just Bob is and uh, and so I was telling you things and about basically what I did at in Kansas City, and um, and then some of that same thing in in Nebraska. And you said, "Can I just can I just show you something on my phone?" And uh, and I think they know the rest of the story. From yeah, there. So what what was on my phone uh, was a document that the elders had put together, worked on uh, for a position for an administrative shepherd uh, that we'd been uh, praying about. Uh, longing for, planning for, drawing up a job description of uh, for the year prior. Uh, and and we had gone down a few paths, talking to a couple of people, and we had ideas. And then uh, this weekend, uh, we happened to be back to square one in a blank slate. I had just had that conversation with Matt Kelso. Uh, well, uh, who else is on the list? I don't have anybody. Do you have anybody? And then... Um, so that, that document was on my phone in a text note. And, and after asking Bob, you know, what, what is it that you do? What, is, what does ministry look like? And he said, I love to do the things that the church needs that the other elders don't do. I, I love to do the things nobody else wants to do. I, I'm good at them, and that's what I love. And, um, and he said, but there's no place for me. I don't know any church that, that needs something like that. So... <laughs> I pulled out this document. I didn't say a word. He just read it. And I think your next words were, are we really having this conversation? What I did at Mission Road. And, uh, and then, yeah, we looked at each other. And, and I think you even said, so, Bob, why are we sitting at this table by ourselves in the Dallas airport at my favorite restaurant? You know, and so, um, yeah. Yeah, just the way God had put those things together. You never fly that airplane, that airline. You don't go through Dallas. You'd never eaten at Papacitos. I always do, and and I always have friends with me, and they all abandoned me. Yeah, and it was just yeah, you. yeah. And yeah. It, it seemed clear that the Lord had arranged that, and um, just so thankful for where that's led us, and uh, sort of the the common parlance for the job that Bob does. Uh, is the role of an executive pastor. If you've been in other churches, you may have uh, encountered a pastor with that title. Um, what does that mean? We simply mean a, a shepherd, a qualified man who shepherds in the local church with some very particular skill sets related to administration, um, getting things done, making things work smoothly. And just by way of confession, uh, administration is not my strong suit. And... Um, we have had others who uh, administrated office things. We've had administrative staff, but we've also had elders like Tom Angstead and Josh Kelso who have taken significant roles behind the scenes, doing the things that nobody would know needs to get done in a church, but if they don't get done, the church falls apart. And, and the kinds of things that require a qualified man who carries the burden of information at the elder level, uh, who actually shepherds people from the heart, uh, there are plenty of managers in the world, plenty of leaders in the world, plenty of executives in the world who can get things done but can run over people. Uh, you need a shepherd who actually steps into lives, can handle God's word, can bring God's word to bear into people's lives while managing and administrating the kinds of tasks required at the elder level. We've never had someone dedicated to that role. And so um, what a lot of churches will label an executive pastor is, is exactly what Bob has done. 
and it is what we had driven, uh, written up a job description for. And so uh, we had a few more conversations and a few more and some visits, and, and here you are. Yeah, the first week of April. That was smarter than July. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was really nice. And I'm thinking, we're in Nebraska, 50 mile an hour winds, it's cold, and I thought, man, this is going to be great. <laughs> and it was drastically different, and has been ever since. <laughs> but just wait, it's going to get better, right? Well, it's funny you mention that, because uh, Tom Engstead and Scott Maxwell came and visited me and Janet in Nashville back in 2007. And they came in December, and that week in Nashville, it was six degrees. And they invited us out, and they said, you should make it quick, like February. And so uh, our, our visits to this area were at the right time of year as well. And uh, yeah. very wise, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Very smart. So we tricked you. You're here. Yep. Uh, Record-setting, longest stretch of triple digits. Yeah. And we're still in it. 110 yeah. today, is that right? And tomorrow? Isn't it October? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. They're doing harvest in, uh, in Nebraska right now. <laughs> we keep pretending. Um, you know, the, the, the fall meals have been the staple menu for the last few weeks in our home. Uh, the kinds of things that make you think about football games and sweaters. Yeah. You know, um, it's like we're trying to force the issue. It's just not working yet. Well, Kathy, I would love to hear from you. When you think about church life and ministry, what do you get excited about? What does that sound like to you? What do you love to do? Um, probably the most, the thing I've done and the thing that I love to do the most is work with children. I have um, taught basically three, four, and five-year-olds and kindergartners for, I don't know, a really, really long time. And I just have a heart for those little ones that they could know scripture and know truths about God that will carry them their whole life. And that's probably the biggest thing. The other thing that I was, I've been involved with and I really love is we, um, I was a big part of TES because uh, Mission Road got TES. We were, I think, church number five. So we had been in it a while and we um, started meeting with the SEM wives and some of our SEM wives were married a week when they came to seminary or, you know, newly married ladies. And so it's been fun through the years just to have an input partly, you know, just by the kindness of God, he's let me be a part of so many young women's lives. And, and I still have relationships with them to this day. And that's been a really a good, a, I don't know, great joy to my heart to see those ladies mature in the Lord and become uh, women of God and supporting their husbands in ministry. So that's, and then I've done a lot of administration stuff alongside Bob, so it's the other thing. Now, Kathy was the administrator for the TES campus in Kansas City for how many years? Uh, ten. Ten years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and is now our TES campus administrator as well, so doing some of those same things. Your ministry in, in Kansas City, uh, your reputation for it preceded you here, particularly in the area of hospitality. Uh, the two of you have become known as the hospitality gurus, uh, the, the, the best hospitality arisers that anybody's ever known. Oh. And so uh, just my encouragement is invite them over to your home for a meal and invite yourselves over to their home um, to enjoy some of that sweet ministry. We enjoy that as well. Um, missionaries that would pop in or people who were just maybe moving to the area or looking at different schools in the area, um, we would have them come to our home as well. So, Speaking of missionary support, Bob, that's been a significant part of your ministry as well. Love to hear where you've been, who you visited, who you know, uh, and some of those experiences. Well, yes, um, I've been uh, Genoa, Italy with Massimo. Uh, we've stayed at their house a number of times in Genoa. We were uh, watched them. We were there when their their little church building and the, what they were doing there uh, was was nothing. It was just a, a dirty old hole in the wall kind of place. And so we watched as that went there. Went back as soon as they got it 
all nice and together and now just so we've been there a number of times visiting and watching that little church grow and um, really loved getting to know Mosmo and Susanna. Um, uh, also in uh, England with Tom Drown and uh, at that church, Grace, Grace Life London there in England. So we spent a number of, we've been there a number of times visiting them and we actually uh, supported, um, what was, uh, yeah, the Wallers, yeah, um, in, uh, at Mission Road, who is Tom, works with Tom, Tom there. Um, there's also, uh, uh, people in, in the, uh, the ITA, Italian Theological Academy, <clears throat> back then, and so there's a number of people there in Sicily and Rome and, um, so we visited them, and uh, and uh, my my job was to be an encouragement to them and bring them back to our church, not physically, but just let get our, let our church get to know them by visiting them. Um, and Rick usually took me. He had usually had a conference he was preaching at, and I'd get to meet with them and find out all about their families and bring them back to the church. Uh, in Germany, in Berlin, there's uh, Christian Andresen who was with the European Biblical Training Center. Um, John Glass in Geneva, yes. John Glass, we've been there at their house a few times. Um, at John, a very interesting fact. I like coffee. This is my crutch sitting up here. Um, and uh, uh, I learned about a Jura machine in Geneva, Switzerland. And that's then, so brought it back to the United States. I didn't bring it physically. I bought one in the United States. And uh, so you heard, hear me talking about a Jura machine and things like that. Uh, so. so we're not going to tell anybody that you've now put one in the offices right. where the elders were. I wasn't going to tell them that. You weren't going to yeah, tell yeah, them yeah, that. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, we have. We keep we those have. doors locked. Yes, yes, yes. And so. Um, you've been I've, in Fiji? I've been to Fiji, yes. Uh, at that time, Mission Road was looking at supporting a, um, a guy there in Fiji and a, a training kind of a training center. I, I don't know if they've come under TMAI yet or not. Have they, Chris? I, I don't know. But anyway, we were, we were looking at that, and um, I think that Mission Road is supporting him now. Uh, uh, and then also have been to Japan again for that kind of a thing. Um, and where did you say? Malawi. Oh, Malawi. Been to Malawi, yeah, two or three times in Malawi. And um, Brian Biedebach was there the first time we went to um, to Malawi. I don't. Some of you might know him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if people come into your office and visit you in there, they'll see half of a canoe. Yes. What, what's that all about? And that, that canoe was dug up out of the mud in Malawi. And so that Brian brought it back to the United States when he came back to the United States. And um, he had a bunch of them. He, he was known all over Malawi. Uh, he going into the villages and um, and he would just get to know the the villages, and, and but he would always say, if you find a canoe, I, I I'll come and dig it up with you. And so he collected all these things, and so um, he brought some back. Is it seaworthy? <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> um, and uh, and he he gave that one to Rick Holland, and Rick Holland gave it to me when I left Mission Road. So. Yeah. And what's it doing now? It's in my office, just holding some things. It's a book. It's book a bookshelf. All right. Yeah, yeah. You, you should step yeah. in and see that. Bob, you're working on a project uh, right now that that involves European things. It's not public, but now I just said something about it. Are we making that public? Well, I, it's just an okay, idea. Okay, so just an idea. Yeah. Um, a couple things I did at Mission Road was I, I organized some church trips uh, to different places, and uh, one of those was a church history tour. And so I asked Smed a while back whether whether or not he would um, be interested, if the church might be interested in 
in doing that. And so, um, and so I'm looking at things. We, I, I've looked at a number of, you know, basically what I did before, and uh, that would be something that would, some probably, encompass. I don't know. We, we depending on the cost, you know, but it would could encompass before it encompassed um, um, Italy and Germany and England Geneva. and Switzerland. Yeah, Geneva. Yeah. Okay, sign up started 30 <laughs> seconds ago. <laughs> Kathy, when you think about Bob Taylor and his ministry, what are his strengths? Um, one of his biggest strengths, I feel like, is that he loves the church and he loves the people of God's church. And so that is, I think that probably propels him to what he does best. Um, Bob has a unique ability um, to care about how the business of the church works and that it has a good reputation outside of the four walls and with the vendors and whoever he works with. But he also has a way of making ministry a priority in that so that he's not just all business or all ministry. He's welding the two together. And um, he has a, I feel like he has a really, God has gifted him that way to do that. It is a very special thing. He's very much about the one another's. Um, Bob is a teacher. He's able to teach, but that is not his gifting. And I think he does a good job, but he would say that is not where he enjoys in ministry. But he does enjoy um, life on life, like meeting with one or two people and just sharing what you're going through and what I'm going through and how can I encourage you and and what can I, you know, do? And that's even like in the church, he enjoys the fact or wants to do the things to free up the elders and even, you know, people in the church said that they, on Sunday morning, they don't have to worry about whatever, or during the week he's got it handled and they can do what they do best, what the elders do best or what, who's ever teaching that week or whatever, so that they can do their best job. And I think that's what Bob does the best, so... And whether you recognize it or not, Grace Bible Church, you've already been benefiting from those strengths and those gifts. And, and the elders have seen that firsthand. Uh, I get to benefit from Bob's uh, shepherding care of my own soul, uh, as well as his tremendous gifting on the administrative side of things in the church. So we're really, really thankful that you're here. Uh, thankful that you suffered and endured uh, first summer. I say have endured because I really do hope and believe that we're at the end of it. Yeah, I think um, so. so. I'm looking uh, forward. I mean, we had that one week break, and mm -hmm. I thought, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. Oh, man. D just wait. You know, you, you dip down into, like, the high 80s, and you start wearing long sleeve shirts. It's coming. <gasps> Mornings have been nicer. Yeah, Mornings we like have early. been almost tolerable. Yeah, That's good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thanks for being a part of Equipping Hour this morning. Uh, we'll dismiss and we'll gather again in about 20 minutes for main service.